Hello, good morning. How are you? And welcome along to 90 Men Talks. My name's Shaban. I'm pleased to see we have Rachel and Sophie from the Girls on the Ball up there. We've got Chris Dealey down there from Fanside and we've got Republic of Ireland and from Liverpool, Leanne Kiernan as well. Good morning all. How are we? Good. Great. Right. I feel, yeah. feel like we're, we're back in lockdown vibes, but yeah, good. Oh. <laughs> It does really it's just it's just train strike day it'll do it to you it'll get you um <laughs> but it's nice to have you all here because we've got lots to go through today um and interestingly we're going to be joined by lizzie bershano who's the u.s editor of 90 men uh, over in america she's going to be with us a little bit later on to talk about the nwsl abuse report uh, and also look ahead to england against the u.s which is this friday um, and also we're going to talk about the Quanta Cup round from the weekend and look at Arsenal and Chelsea in the Champions League. So lots to get on. Um, but first, how are we all? Anybody get anything they would like to share with the group before we delve in? <laughs> Dark secrets or something. Yeah. Well, I'd quite like to share them to be shared if you've got any. Um, Leanne, it's nice to have you with us. And we are we are sorry because you're you're out injured just now. And it must be such a tough time, especially when there's big things coming up for your country. Yeah, of course. First game in the league, typical, isn't it? Um, and to be fair, I've never been injured or got surgery before like this. So it's been it's been a big eye opener that football is quite my life and I need to get a life outside of football, I guess. But um, no, it's been great. Like my mom has my mom has traveled over and been with me for the past two weeks, which is really helpful because obviously my roommate's in Wales at the moment. Mm. so uh, yeah it's been tough I don't think it's hit me yet I've just been in a, a lot of pain I just got surgery so I think feel like I'm, I'm still tripping on my codeine <laughs> yeah oh bless you Do you know it's um it's weird I've actually seen a couple of posts um just on my timeline over the last week of women who've been struggling with their injuries just now Remy Allen as well and um, we put up a post the other day just how hard it is you know and just how sad it is when the season returns and everyone's going for it and you're your club's doing well and, you know, you've got big things coming up and you can't be part of it. It's just so, it must be lonely. Yeah, of course. Like in West Ham, I've been out for maybe six, eight, ten months with my shin splints, but I could always like go on the pitch, see the girls and then come off with offloading and that. Where now I'm just like, this is the first day I've been in. I'm actually in the physio room right now. It's the first day I've seen the girls since, since maybe a week or two. So it's just, I don't know, probably Liverpool has been quite good at making me feel a part of the group still. And they've been giving me opportunities to work in the media side and do other bits that I'm still like in the picture, which has been quite nice. I guess like I'm out for five or six months, all going to plan touch wood. So I had the PFA ring me about an education system and that, which is also quite helpful. So maybe it's a sign that I need to get educated well and that. <laughs> just use this time, use this time, but it must be just just rubbish when you want to go out and play and um, there's so much going on around you, but you can't be part of it. I can't imagine that frustration. Uh, Rachel, Sophie, yeah, you guys speak to players all the time who are going through that. Can anybody give Leanne some advice? Because I feel pretty useless in this moment. <laughs> well, I was going to say, literally yesterday, uh, I was speaking to Claire Rafferty, who did her ACL three times. And if she's not like an inspiration as someone who can come back and keep going, like she played for England after her third ACL injury, I, like she's a great person to look at as someone who kind of dealt with injuries, knew she could come back and, and did it and did it well on the biggest stage. So it's just funny that we happen to be talking to you the next day, but um, that would, that would be the biggest thing I'd take away from, from Raf is, is just knowing it's, it is doable, like, absolutely doable. Exactly. Yeah. I've actually, I'm actually good friends with Raf. I played with her in West Ham and she's a great person as well. So I'll definitely might give her a call over the next few weeks. Aww. Did she recommend don't do it three times? You just leave it at one. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Christ. <laughs> I'll drop your send for the positive spin on uh, on everything today. Um, but yeah, sh should we focus on Liverpool actually just um, for the beginning? Because it was an interesting opening game, wasn't it? And it feels like a bit of a, a wee bit of a throwback now. Um, but what was that feeling like watching from from the sidelines, watching Liverpool beat Chelsea and their return to the WSL? This one's for me, I'm guessing, is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was. Um, I was quite nervous going out on the pitch. I won't lie for the first game, and then. Um, 
I don't know. I think the first minute when we conceded that penalty, I just thought it was just a bit different. Like I just thought like we're one nil down here, but we haven't even played. Like we have so much more to go for. And I remember, I think it was the 50th minute I went down injured and got taken off screaming. I was in the physio room screaming and I could hear the whole crowd cheering. And I goes, oh my God, I think we've just scored. So yeah. I got the physio. I think he lifted me out and I hobbled <laughs> out and I seen we had a penalty and I goes, this is amazing. <laughs> So we scored the peno and then I obviously sat there. I'm not going to lie, I was in a lot of pain, but it was helping me that Katie Stengel was just popping the ball in the back of the net. Mm. And when she got the second, I just thought, you know what, this season, this season's going to be an eye-opener for people that maybe think we're underdogs and that we're just not here just to, to be here in this league. We're here to compete, which is really like, I feel like we worked really hard over pre-season. Mm. And we have a great group of girls and a great quality in the team. It's just on our day, we just we can show it. So hopefully, hopefully we crack on from there. Chris, what have you made of uh, Liverpool since the return to the WSL? As we know, it was a shock. Even the Liverpool players were, were seeing that as well. Um, but what do you want to see more of moving forward? Um, well, I mean, I don't know if you remember our preview uh, show I had Liverpool maybe struggling a little bit. So I, I think any time I, I know, <laughs> I didn't know you were coming on. Uh, <laughs> I think basically you've just got to have me on every time and just say, ah, well, this weekend's probably going to be tough because I wasn't on before the Everton game and then look what happened. So, yeah. uh, but no, it's, it's you know, it's, 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 it's what, kind of what you're saying, you know, the, 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 getting the group together, keeping the, the momentum positive and, you know, the, I guess the confidence that comes from being a team like Chelsea um, does wonders for your season that early. Exactly, and I to be you know just you know shortly after that crowd, Leanne, what an amazing turnout at Anfield! Do you know what it was an amazing experience, and the fan the fans in Liverpool are amazing. You'd hear them a mile away, so um, no, it was great, and it wasn't just kids there; it was families. It was people that was working on our apartment building, the whole workers, they're all heading to the game. And I think mom was saying that when she flew over, the whole Ryanair flight was just full of people just coming to our game. And wow. I just think that's mad to think like Ryanair is filling out flights to come to a women's game. I think it's amazing and how far the women's game has come. So um, no, it's been really nice. Unfortunately, we didn't, we didn't do great on the day, but it's definitely a learning curve and hopefully we'll get another chance to prove ourselves in Anfield. I mean, I, I loved it. And even sitting down on the on that Sunday night to see putting on Sky Sports and seeing the game live there after a big weekend, to see the turnout like that as well. Um, and to see, you know, a brilliant game, you know, you've got to hand it to Everton. They were they were they were really, really strong. Um, and even then, you know, because we had previewing that game, we were actually looking and going, Everton have to turn it around, you know, massively this season. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I found it a thoroughly enjoyable experience. I know it wouldn't be from the scoreline. What was, what was the, um, the, the aftermath of that game from Matt Beardley on? I think it was just like we're in the WSL now. We know that we can't afford not showing up. Like in some games that every tackle, every recovery run and every pass counts. And when we get the ball back to keep it and that. So I guess... It's just about going back to the drawing board and working hard and training. And maybe it was um, a dose of reality that we all need it. Just to kind of say now, like we got to, obviously the girls are great and they're always going to work hard, but Everton on the day, I'll give it to them. They were brilliant. And we'll be ready for the, the Goodison Derby. Don't worry. <laughs> I feel like with the Chelsea match, it's almost like the pressure was off there because you were going in against the champions and you could just go out and maybe <clears throat> play a bit freer. Whereas then almost when you played the, the derby, you could kind of see the nerves. You know, uh, there was a great clip of the huddle and everyone singing, you'll never walk alone. And I I'm sure that gives you a buzz, but also it's something you've probably not massively experienced. And maybe there was an element of you, you thought you could go out there and win it. And maybe the pressure then just to compare the two matches feels like they were quite different um, for the experiences for the team, I guess. It's something Matt Beard touched on, wasn't it, after the kind of occasion was a big one. Yeah, for sure. And it, I, I don't know how many of the girls have played in front of 27,500, maybe. And 
it was a very loud experience in that where we're used to Prenton Park but no it was a great experience in the way the fans come in and that I just think that we can work on that and build and the next time we play in Anfield hopefully we'll be ready and we'll be we'll be aware of what we're going to expect next time. Is there a season ambition, Leanne? Are you like to share that with us? Like, what's oh. the? What's, what's it's all like... up on this whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just, um... <laughs> you mind. you give us all the details? <laughs> um, no, I think we know within our dressing room what we're capable of, and when when training goes well in the week. And if we're willing to work hard, which I know every girl is on this team and the ability we have, and we have some great mature players that came in and we have some great youth on our team that kind of make the team quite good. And like, we're listen, we're not going into any game thinking that we're not capable of winning. Like people would have looked at Chelsea and would have said like, Chelsea's going to win this game. But deep down, we, we knew that if we could compete, which we did, we could definitely get a result. And I think we'll go into every game looking like that. And of course, everything, everything, I feel like um, we're just going to forget about that one and move on. It happens, the best teams in the world, I guess. So, mm. yeah, but I guess um, I think we'd be happy. We'd be happy up rather the top rather than the bottom of the table. But let's just see how it goes. <laughs> I've enjoyed um, watching Liverpool from the championship last season and gaining promotion. And there's been a good spectacle around Liverpool for it feels like a wee while now. Um, and we saw that with the amount of fans turning out as well. And I feel like I want to know more about the, the dressing room for, for Liverpool because there was quite a few changes as well in the summer. Who's the biggest character in there? Me, Fahi, without a shadow of a doubt. What a woman. <laughs> <laughs> she's gas. She's, um, <laughs> she's one of the most mature, I'll say, on the team, but then the most immature you'll ever meet. So um, with COVID, our dressing rooms have been split. And we never went back because we're quite content, 11 and one, 11 and the other or whatever. So I have Fahi in mind. She's just, she's a gas ticket. Like you just, could, <laughs> I've never experienced anybody like her. When it comes to captaincy, like one of the best captains I've worked under. Um, I've obviously worked under it. Katie's been brilliant too. And Jilly Flaherty. But um, I guess just really good at knowing when you need like a kick up the ears maybe. And like you need to get, you need to start working Leanne or you need like a hand on the back just to say like what's wrong I feel like she's really got that down to a T and everybody respects her which is quite nice to see and you know that like if I had any issues off the pitch which I often went to Fahi because I trust her trust her with my life you know I feel like she's a very genuine person and she's been one of the reasons what attracted me to Liverpool Wow, that, that's huge praise there. Um, I also want to ask about Taylor Hines. Is she single? Because I think I might be in love with her. <laughs> that person, how beautiful is that woman? She is so stunning. Anytime she gets seen on the TV, I was like... I'd feel like that shouldn't need to be... You need to be reminded about that. Wow. Um, well, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on her relationship life because I don't think it's it's my it's my place on a podcast. But um, <laughs> nah, Taylor Taylor is Taylor is a nice girl and um, she's really good for the team. Very very <laughs> pleasure response there, Leanne. You get a straight lace to like it, uh, but I'd say, I think she's such a babe. Anyway, uh, what's Matt Beard like? How's he getting on? Beard is great. Um, as you know, Beardy's a big family man, actually. Harry is wee son here. He's just been in, in the oh. office there this morning and he gets on well with the whole staff and everything. Now, Beardy's great and Beardy understands, like, I am quite home bored when it comes to not being able to play football. So he's told me, like, take my time away from the team, go home, go see the dogs, be around family. Like, he's been very good like that. And Beardy's always been quite understanding which is why maybe I signed with Liverpool also. Like, I know that he knows me best as a person as well as a player. And my initial needs maybe off the pitch, which has been really nice. And he's really good. Like, even with the girls, we have some foreigners on our team too that maybe kind of feel homesick and that. And he's very good at, like, if you just need a few days off, go home, reset, and come back. And I guess, like, he's a family man. He has kids himself, and he realises that it's it's sometimes a tough environment to be around and a break's quite good no but he's been really good and I've learned a lot throughout the last this is my fifth year under Beardy actually he's my only professional coach and um 
I'm not going to lie. I was like a headless chicken coming in. God love him. <laughs> he had a lot of work to do. But um, now I feel like I'm, I'm understanding the game a lot more. And he's very good at individual. Like, I will put my hand up and I'll feel comfortable by saying in front of the team, like, I don't get what you mean. And he would never belittle you or anything like that. He would, he would encourage people to put their hands up and want to learn and understand why. I'm, as you know, with women, we, we get told what to do, but we want to understand why we have to do it where men will probably just go and do it, where I feel like he's very good like that. So I have total praise for him so far anyway. I think you look at um, the Liverpool squad, and I think none of us were worried about Liverpool this season because of the squad, but also because of Matt Beard and the kind of the experience that he brings, you know, and that sort of what he's done before at Chelsea, Liverpool, Bristol, and back at Liverpool, and then also in Boston. You know, he's he's been there, got the T-shirt. He's so experienced. Um... And I do think he he brings the best out of his players as well. Um, I get the feeling when I talk to to people. Yeah, exactly. And he's a his background staff's been brilliant. Like the analysis guys, the S and C coaches, the physios, assistants. Amber's great. Maka, like he has a lot of help, which really does well with him. Like I feel like they all have a great relationship. Like I'd often go into sometimes his um the office is the best crack at the whole place. You go in and you just have a chat and. He has Carlsberg zero in the fridge if you want a zero. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. And a it's coffee. Nice and, <laughs> yeah, so sometimes, even though I've been out, like, it's just been two weeks now, but I I go in there and you just got obsessions with the doctor and that, like, it's a really good, it's like a, a family environment, I guess, like. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. But um, no, it's, it's good crack. Yeah, no, it's, it sounds like I love that he's got a wee Carlsberg zero fridge. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's the kind of guy I'm after. But see, um, in terms of the, we, we, we've been focusing a lot on this show about the clubs that are very much so seen over the women and the men and it's all one club. Liverpool seem like they're, they're setting a bit of an example there. How involved and how linked are you to um, the men's side or the men's team? Yeah, I guess I've, um, I've heard Liverpool in the past have not been as good, but now definitely I've signed, I've been here a year and a bit now, and they've been brilliant. Like, Jürgen, I remember he presented Fernie with her award last year, and he said, like, he would love us to be a one club and a part of it. We train, we train on the world, actually, so we're not at the AXA Centre, but I feel like Liverpool are, are going to provide us with a, our own state-of-the-art training centre in the next year, hopefully. Um and no, they've been great. And all media things, like I remember the last media kit, kit launch we done, I was sitting beside Mane and Trent and a few of the lads and they're just all down to earth and Klopp's there and he's having the crack with us. And like, they're all human at the end of the day. And some people forget that, like, obviously they're professional footballers and a lot of people look up to them, but they are very sound. And Klopp's, you can tell he's a proper family man, like the way... He had a great relationship with Curtis Jones and the young lads on the team when I was there because we were there for a few hours and kind of like a dad vibes. <laughs> but no, it was really nice. And then um, they'd always come out of their way to come speak to us. Trent was actually at one of our games in Prenton last year. and I saw that. And, yeah. yeah, just sitting beside, sitting behind me with his friends. Was he but learning how to defend? Him. Sorry? Was he learning how to defend? <laughs> I won't comment here. Um, <laughs> but no, like, they'd definitely be good. And I feel like the open top bus tour around when they won the league in that, I missed it. I was actually stuck in Paris, the Champions League, but I think the girls had a great time and a great time with the boys and that, so it was quite nice. Great. Brilliant. Um, let's move on, shall we, um, and talk about the Conti Cup from the weekend as well, because there was a couple of upsets in there but I think the one that we were all focusing on was Aston Villa beating Manchester United on penalties um Chris what did you make of that performance um I think they must have borrowed the uh the goals that I set up for the Arsenal <laughs> game because what seven penalties saved in the shootout seven, 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 what's seven. going on no, was it seven seven, seven saved seven, yeah. seven saved and Elliot saved four um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, seven in total saved in that penalty shootout. Mm. That's a wee bit bizarre, isn't it? That's insane. Well, great saves. Like, absolutely brilliant saves. Anna Leeds on, I think it was on a budget. 
Um, I don't know. She seemed to fly past the ball and then bent her arm around to get claw it out of the goal. I was like, "What are you doing? Like, that's ridiculous." <laughs> um, no, it was it was a quality game. I think um, I'm very impressed by Aston Villa. They they look really really good this season. Um, that's that's my impression of them from the game so far. Is that they do look really good. Rachel Daly, everything that was promised and everything that we knew she was. Yeah. yeah. In the first half, she was kind of playing all over. Um, obviously, Man United went up. Was it 1-0 in the yeah. first half? Um, and she, was, she wasn't she was really influencing the game that much, but um, Villa made a few subs and she was able to then play up front. And my God, what a difference that made. That That's the difference for me with Villa this season is that if they, they go one down or they have a difficult first half, they don't kind of take their foot off the gas in the second. And that's what impressed me against Man United was they were the better side in the second half and actually were unlucky, I think, not to win it. Yeah. In, oh. in regular time, obviously, they won it on that bizarre penalty extra point situation, but they were unlucky not to get all three. Yeah. What do you think, Leanne, of the the Conte, the, the, the League Cup? It feels like um, it can be a distraction for some teams, um, but it's one of those competitions that's still not really attractive yet. How do clubs view it? I think... Um... Obviously, sometimes it's hard if you're playing two. Like, I remember last year we were playing two London teams on the Sunday and the Sunday, and we had a Conti Cup game away on the Wednesday, which is quite tough because you're traveling a lot. I think it was up in Sunderland or something. So it's it's quite a lot of trekking and that. But obviously, everybody wants to win trophies, and the more trophies that you're in for, the, the more likely you are to maybe get far in them. So, um, and I think it's also a great opportunity to give players game time and give them a chance to shine and as Beardy said at the after Anfield that there's a lot of jerseys up for grabs which which I think should be every weekend and I feel like a lot of girls get to prove a point that like they're not just here to be a part of the squad that they want to be in the starting 11 so I think the cup is great for that kind of thing for sure. Yeah. Rachel Sophie in fact on that note like that that is the that is the opportunity for so hi <laughs> <laughs> Fernie, Fernie's just here. Hi guys! Oh, Rachel Furness, legend. Yeah. Legend. They're saying that you're a legend. Um, <laughs> um, hi. How are you? How are you? Can't hear anything. <laughs> Good hi, morning, Rachel. everyone. Welcome. We're live. You're oh, live. hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Just you know, crashing, crashing the superstar here. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. What's going on in training today? Well, it's a very um, it's a very dry one today. Slashing rain. No, honestly, um, it's going to be horrendous. It'll be the best. Who can do the best slidey? I reckon. Kinsman, <laughs> <laughs> come on. I'll let you enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Rachel. Um, I was Sorry actually going that. To... <laughs> that was gold. Um, I See on um, when when you get cup games and it's good to see other players get opportunities as well. That's exactly what happened to Annalia because she is number two, number three goalkeeper for Aston Villa and girls in the ball. For her to have a game like that, for such a, a quiet and reserved character to come out and do that just shows you that you know, Villa have now got a bit of depth as well. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that was her debut for Aston Villa. Um, and it wasn't just a penalty save, it was... Um, in the 93rd minute, Ella Toon was through a goal and she was just faced up with Ella Toon. You know, you'd better your life on Ella Toon scoring that. And she made herself big and managed to stop it. Um, that's a huge moment for her, a huge uh, boost of confidence, I think. Um, and I, th I think you're right, Leanne, like someone like Liv McLaughlin for Villa as well. She got her first minutes of the season and she was absolutely superb. I mean, she's just 17 years old, but that gives her the, ch the, the chance to platform her you know, her skills and what she can do and, and say to Carla Ward, listen, I'm here, you know, think about me more every every week and I can I can hold my own against one of the best teams in the country. I, I like the Conti Cup. Um, I think the formatting is a bit confusing and I think <clears throat> that's probably what throws people a little bit as well in terms of the attractiveness of the competition. But I like that it gives teams more minutes, gives players more minutes. It gives teams lower down the league or in championship to play teams above and that's how they're going to develop like when you look at say the champions league and bridging the gap it's you need to be playing bit better standard games in order to to grow yourselves and i think the conti cup gives that opportunity for teams right through the top two leagues um i just think it needs more coverage for it to be more attractive like it's not really covered that much and i think that's not ideal either because it, it doesn't give the game 
give the games the kind of gravitas they deserve. Can I yeah, for you sure. Think- I- sorry, sorry. sorry no, go on. For sure, I would agree with the coverage wise. Like, I was sitting at home, me and mom and Kerry Holland, it was her boyfriend was here for the weekend, and they were in Sunderland away. And they were trying to put a stream up through Twitter on Sunderland. The stream wouldn't work, and we're trying to follow tweets. And I just feel like it could definitely be broadcast it more that you could see these people, as you say, um, Liv McLaughlin and all, like, shine and see that, like, they have a great chance of getting into the starting 11 when it comes to league games. Cause I feel like if it was a men's game, they'd definitely be live. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And I mean, look, after, you know, you, you always, you know, I think the, the, the phrase after the Euros is, is pretty much rote at this point, but you know, after the Euros, there's such an appetite for, you know, for people to, to, to be able to go and watch more women's football, like the Conti Cup's an opportunity to do that, but you, you've got to actually put it in front of people. It's, it's the, it's the same thing as always. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I spoke to, after Ajax, we spoke to Lotta Wubimoy, um of Arsenal, and she was saying, like, you know, going through to the Champions League group stage now opens them up to three more games at the Emirates. That was what they're calling from, from, from the Euros, that kind of thing. And it's about trying to make it as accessible as possible, every single game as accessible as possible, um, for people to encourage the demand to grow. But even the demand is there. We've seen the demand is there. But to try and make it accessible for people, you have to have coverage of all of these games because people want to devour sport. Like, you know, they want to devour as many games as possible, um, whether it's online or, or, or live. Um, and we just need to make it more accessible for them. Yeah, there's um, a review board and, you know, Karen Carney looking after being chair of this board. Um, what's it called? Sophie, you know what it's called? The um... the review oh. that Karen Carney's doing. Yeah. Yeah. What's her yeah. title again? <laughs> We're all it's, sitting it's here me. like <laughs> it's left me. <laughs> Going for this um, um, review of lift, lifting the the blackout uh, ban as well for the three three o'clock um, game on a Saturday, and the the WSL and the FA have, have shown that this works for the best attendances, the best viewership as well. That three o'clock game on a Saturday would be the ideal time, and actually having. Having kids myself, I actually look and go, I can't get to Borenwood at seven o'clock on a Friday night, but I would be there at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. You know, you can make yeah. that work and that's the kind of audience that the women's game is bringing in. It's really like fun, family friend, friendly kind of atmosphere. So um, hopefully that will happen and we'll know more on that very, very soon. Um, we're going to welcome in now uh, Lizzie Bershano, who is the 90 men uh, editor over in the US. Uh, Lizzie, good morning. How are you? You all right? Hi, good morning. Happy 6.30 a.m. <laughs> you are. I'm sorry for getting you up so early. You look lovely and fresh though. Oh, thank you. I try and know, but I'm very, very excited to be on. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Um, we've got Leanne Kiernan from Republic of Ireland. And Hi, Lizzie. Lizzie. Hello. Rachel Sophie from Girls of the Ball and Chris Dealey here as well. Um, Lizzie, can you give us an update on this report, please, um, for the NWSL, the abuse report? Yeah, so um, it's quite a bit. Last year, U.S. soccer, our governing um, soccer federation, wanted to launch an investigation into all the sexual abuse and verbal abuse allegations going on in the NWSL. Um the investigation, independent investigation, was conducted by former Attorney General Sally Q. Yates. And one year later, that's been made available, which is absolutely crazy. Um, the report is over 300 pages, split really into two different sections. One is findings, which is about 172 pages, even more shocking. But the second section is recommendations that U.S. soccer wants to impose on NWSL. Um, Basically, in an overarching manner, the findings report that verbal abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual misconduct exist in the highest forms of soccer in the United States, um, women's professional soccer. And the most shocking aspect is that executives, coaches, USF leaders and former U.S. women's national team head coach Jill Ellis, everyone knew and chose instead to protect themselves and their images instead of their players. Now, the report spans every club, really, but focuses on three and three former coaches that dive into 
loads of subsections, but um, Paul Riley, Christy Hawley, um, Rory Dames, those three figures really just broke everything within the NWSL. And you could see everyone is really interrelated. You had former GMs and current GMs of um, NWSL clubs recommending these coaches and firing them for sexual abuse from one club, but then publicly saying um, we parted ways or we didn't renew them, but I recommend him in the former club. So it just spanned years and years and no one really got to the root of the problem. Oh my goodness. That is it's actually giving me chills a little bit. I mean, that's really um sad it's just really really sad Lizzie is there going to be a change from this I take it I mean people are feeling more comfortable now to come out and speak people are sharing their experiences now as well um we hope so it's going to be a long process unfortunately a lot of the people involved in the investigation are still currently with the teams so now there's pressure from players and fans for these individuals to sell their shares and no longer be part of the league as a whole, as part of the healing process, that has not been done. Um, US soccer also said we can impose, but we cannot infer or rule over the NWSL, which is shocking. Um, and the league has not taken immediate action, though there is investigation still going on by the NWSLPA, and each club is handling manners, but though we hope. I think it's a long journey towards the change we all want to see. I think the the we hope as well when you when you're looking at the clubs uh, doing their own investigations, you've got three clubs: uh, the the Thorns, the uh, Chicago Red Stars, and uh, Louisville. Who, um, you know, the the investigation said, "Oh yeah, they didn't actually cooperate uh, the way we wanted them to. They didn't they didn't give us the the information. They weren't talking to us." Um, Not only which, that, um, they were threatening witnesses, they were threatening employees with NDAs, and it's comical at this point because the owners of these clubs came out with a statement saying they will no longer govern, but they're still part of the team. So There seems to be a complete lack of accountability, um, which is startling. There was a line in one of the reports that, um, because obviously it was systematic, so it was right through the, the youth levels as well, and it touched on how many of these players, because they'd experienced these behaviours and abuses from a young age, that by the time they got to pro level, they didn't even identify these behaviours as abusive, which is just so grim that like, it's so ingrained in them. Um, and it also, I think, highlights for me the way sport tends to be elevated above all else and clubs tend to be elevated above all else. And we see it in the men's game here. If someone does something seriously problematic or breaks the law, you know, we don't want the way we enjoy our sport or our club to be damaged by that. And that seems to be the priority rather than the victim. Um, and I think you're kind of seeing that now in, in the NWSL as well, that the priority was protect the club at all costs and not protect the victim, which is just harrowing. Leanne, how do you feel listening to this, that players went through that? You know, um, the article came out yesterday and I, I had read it. And it was actually one of my um, good friends that I experienced that, and I had no idea. And I just texted her and I just said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, because I, no, I had no idea she went through any of that. <laughs> and I just said, like, I'm so sorry you were alone and experienced any of that, because it's just horrendous. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I just had no idea and it was just I just seen it somebody sent me the article and I just thought like how somebody can do that to an innocent girl <laughs> and how it could have been like anyone's daughter I guess or anything but that's yeah. the organization fostered this like you can't you don't feel supported you know to come forward and actually say these things and that's what's so heartbreaking is that people ultimately kind of went through this alone, you know? So to have these players then to come forward, knowing that makes them, makes you realize just how brave and how strong they had to be to be able to come forward and to keep knocking on that door because without those players knocking on that door, it would have been swept under the carpet. So for me, like they're just 
absolute heroes to be able to do that, to recount those tales and keep knocking on that door until something's done about it. Yeah. And now, you know, you're not, that's the thing. I think that even having these conversations, Leanne, I'm, I'm sorry that your friend went through that and I'm sorry that it's made you so upset, but it's people will listen. You know, no one's going to get away with behavior like that anymore. And everybody's got people who will take them seriously, listen and love them. Um, and for anybody who's ever experienced that, you know, you have to talk, you know, you can't bottle that up because, you know, you will be listened to and you will be supported. Um, Lizzie, thank you. Thank you very much um, for that detail. We appreciate it and we'll speak to you soon, okay? Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, shall we focus on um, the... You know, I've never, I've never cried in public, crazy. That's oh, not me. You've got to get off your chest, Leanne. It's yeah. harsh. Is your friend just, okay I, now? I just messaged her and I just, like, I've, I've lived with the girl and everything and I just said, like, you know, you have no idea. You see social media, and you see they're so happy. Yeah. And she was great for me. Like when I, when I moved over, and that she was just a great person, and was really. She came to my home in Ireland and everything. And I just thought, like, how, how can somebody so innocent and that be? Like, you don't know what that's done to her mental health or anything, and how it was kept in the background for so long. And like for me to read it in an article and see what she has been through, like, and how. Did you read some of it? It's horrific. Yeah, it's yeah. awful. Yeah, but, yeah. I'm just glad that everybody's kind of being found out because I feel like we play football because we love it and it's a safe environment. And I just think if I ever had like a daughter or somebody that was sent into an environment like that, it's scary, you know, what it can do to their life. For sure. I think clubs need to be much more proactive in terms of player welfare instead of this reactive approach that we're seeing in the NWSL and waiting for things to blow up before they actually do anything about it like as you say Leanne you're you're people you're not commodities to a club you're people and you should be the priority for clubs like your welfare should be priority for clubs and I just hope clubs and and federations around the, the world are looking at this and looking at themselves and making sure these things are in place yeah for sure and it's just, yeah, it's just, you don't know, you don't know. Um, it's kind of scary probably for, as you say, Siobhan, you're a mom, like sending your kids to a coach, like you don't know what they're going to expect. I've been lucky that, like, thankfully, I've never, I've never experienced anything like it. Or I've never been put in that situation, like manipulation and that. So, um, but yeah, it's just, it's horrific. And I yeah. just really hope that. It's been like the amount of them coaches and as Lizzie said, a hundred and something pages of that. That's just outrageous how they're getting away with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've heard I've heard a lot of stories from so many different people who have been in situations that are not okay, you know, that will happily go on as if it didn't happen because, you know, they were fine at the end of the day. But um it, it's the point is that it's it's just exploiting somebody innocent who's meant to be in a safe zone and and that for me is that yeah you know that's the, that's the heartful bit that you know your friend went through that and put, puts on a brave face and everything's meant to be okay and they're there at the thing that they love but somebody's doing something that just should not be acceptable and they get away with it um Liana have you got somebody to talk to there like you know if it, I, I know you're going through a lot at the minute the injury's hard you know, times can be really, really hard on you just on that point that Rachel mentioned there. Do you have somebody at the club who you can speak to? Yeah, no, the club has been great. Like, I've been I've been pretty good like that and they provide whatever we need, thankfully. So it's been really good. Like, as I said, like, this club has been, has been great. So I have no complaints on that front whatsoever. I just yeah. think it just caught me on the hop when you're reading an article and it's one of your really close friends that you had no idea about and you're just like, wow. Yeah. Like, I feel like it, it It really, like, I know it's terrible on anybody, but when you know them well and you know that they're a really good person mm -hmm. and how somebody could do that, it's just horrific. Awful, awful. Yeah. Please, um, I know it won't touch the sides, but, you know, all of us here in this space now are here because we love women in football. Yeah. We love the growth of the women's team. You know, there's so many people who have so much sympathy and offer so much support to anybody who's who's been through that you know I, I cannot imagine and I really hope your friend's okay um but yeah uh, not good enough it feels hard I, to 
my hope from this report is that it's a turn of starting to turn the tide. You know, we're starting to see across the world that play, players, especially female players, are starting to find their voices and feeling that they can speak up when things aren't going right. And that's at different, maybe different levels of the extreme side that is happening or has happened in the NWSL um, to, you know, the stuff at Spain recently with Jorge Bilder and how they're speaking up and, and trying to, you know, push the federation for change for better better circumstances for themselves. Um, I, I think we are starting to see a change in, in the way that these stories are told, but also the, the kind of the power that players have and the, the voices that they can project to, to, to make things known that would never have been known before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, coming up um, on for, for Ireland, Leanne, you've got a, a huge opportunity ahead of you just around the corner, World Cup 2023. Um, and it's a massive game for Ireland on Tuesday next week because you're going to be facing either Austria or Scotland. Um, that game's this Thursday. Uh, Austria are at Hamden facing Scotland. The outcome of that game will see Ireland's fate going into the World Cup. How do you feel about it? What's going on? Have you heard from things within within the camp? To be fair, I'm quite close with a lot of the girls, so I'll get a daily FaceTime on the updates on what's happening. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been told I've been missed so far and Courtney Brosnan hasn't even met it to camp. And I goes, OK, I'll take that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, no, I'm really looking forward to it. If it's Scotland, I'd like to think I could get up. Some of the girls here would want to go up and watch it too because obviously probably one of the biggest games the the women's team has ever experienced and I think it would be great to be a part of and support my team and no yeah but I'm really looking forward to it and I'm really feeling very positive about it I feel like we've gone this far we're going to go the whole way yes yeah well, Rachel you've got a fellow dub over there as well yeah um, to be fair in it, <laughs> um, everything you know, my um, my sister Rusha, who plays for Ireland, she's she's with the injured squad uh, with yourself. We and, really make another squad of just. I, I know, I know. <laughs> you guys, Savannah, need, they're all heading up. Outfits for this. <laughs> Will Rusha head up if it's in Scotland? I, I'm actually going to speak to her about that today. I think so. I mean, and that even Matt, I, I'm on a nerves ending the idea of Ireland against Scotland because, well, yeah, I, I like the idea of that being at Hampden and you know the ticket sales for that. Scotland are are struggling. You know, they, they you know Ireland selling out uh, at Tallis Stadium just a, a few weeks ago was amazing. You know. Yeah. Next step, you'll be pushing for the Aviva, and then Scotland trying to sell out at Hamden. You know, the, I think the most they've ever sold ticket wise was 18 and a half thousand, and that was a few years ago now. You know, really trying to just grow the women's game in these in these smaller countries that are just everything to us. Um, I just I love the idea of it, and then we we need Ireland to go. You know, it just has to happen. <laughs> it just has to. You, you will you will you will be a nervous wreck for for any game at Hamden, though, won't you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll be like, I'll have my saltire face, right? I'll be like, William Wallace by face, and then like Ireland and Heart. It's gonna be, it's gonna be all tough for the old man. I kind of. I kind of want to come and just sit with you guys rather than do it as a journalist. It sounds way more fun. I'll just be there sweating on the sideline by myself. I'd rather be with a, a nice group of people. <laughs> Um, also, I just want to bring Lizzie Bershano, our US editor, back in actually to the call. Lizzie, I'm sorry I said goodbye to you earlier on. No worries. Um, no worries. Uh, Lizzie, it's the US coming over to face England at Wembley, another sellout at Wembley for England women, the second time in a few months. What's the what's the expectations from the, the USA going up against the, the World Cup champions against the European champions? Well, it's, it's huge, actually. Um, I think everyone wants to go off of the momentum of the Euros and go for a stellar game. It's disappointing. Alex Morgan won't be there. Just she um, is injured. So we won't see another tea celebration. But we have the World Cup next year to focus on that. No problem. <laughs> um, but no, the expectations are huge. I think sadly the report came out and um, kind of dimmed the light on everything and Head coach Vladko Andonovsky has said if any players need to miss the game, miss any press conferences, miss anything, it is completely acceptable. And Becky Sauerbrunn, the captain, has said 
players are not necessarily doing well, but there is still this excitement. England is a huge opponent. And I think really everyone's looking forward to these new faces like Sophia Smith and seeing Mallory Pugh again, Rose Lavelle as a veteran. It's We're excited. I think above everything going on, we're still excited to see the game. Because Rose Lavelle, a veteran, I remember when she was like, big to break up, oh, I don't to feel old. I was going to ask. It's horrible. Because, yeah. Before, I, I don't, you know, USA was always a team everyone wanted to play because you're the best in the world. So it's always a big game for whoever the opponent is. But it maybe necessarily wasn't the, the same in the reverse for you guys. It maybe wasn't such an exciting deal to be playing some of these teams. But now that England won the Euros, now that they've sold out Wembley, it's almost like it's equally exciting for both teams, which maybe we haven't kind of had that before. Would that be fair? Yeah, definitely. I think from our end, it's a huge opponent. And one of the most anticipated friendlies I've seen more people than I can kind of jet off to England to watch the game. And that like, it's been a huge m movement really. Like everybody wants to watch this game. I remember everyone was buying tickets and the queue was unreal. It was like 13,000 people in front of me. So I waved goodbye to the game, but everyone else who's getting to go, it's, it's this huge excitement and we haven't seen that in a bit. And U.S. plays friendlies constantly. We've played Japan, Saudi Arabia, um, Uzbekistan, like, but I don't think I've seen quite the commotion that I've seen with this game. I will say, I think it's um, on behalf of RFA, it was the biggest marketing coup that they could have, have, have wished for. I mean, they did it two days after winning the European Championships that they announced the, the U.S. coming to Wembley, you know. We talked earlier about having that bounce from the Euros and having that momentum. You know, this is a way to do it and having these kind of world championship against champions against European championships is, is absolutely huge. They sold like 60,000 tickets in pre-sale alone. And that was before they even went on sale, which is just, I mean, you talk about queues. We also got tickets and you were in the queue online for like four hours or something. It's just insane. It's going to be... Absolutely epic. Um, can I get your predictions, please? I know it's a friendly, but there'll be nothing friendly about it. There's a few changes to the England side as well. Leah Williamson, uh, their captain, is now out injured, which also sucks for Arsenal as well. Uh, Alessio Russo's um, out with an injury. Of course, then we're missing Ellen White now from the England side. Um, wondering if we're going to see Rachel Daly further up the pitch after our Aston Villa... <laughs> Wonder weeks. I mean, the, everything's possible. Uh, Leanne, I know you're diehard Ireland, but can you give me a prediction for this? Feel free to go for the USA. Do you know, I haven't seen the US play recently, but I'm going to go 2 1 to the US. Mm. Oh. <laughs> um, one, play Rachel Daly up front, always. Two, uh, England. To win 2 1, like they should have done at the World Cup, but for the villain Phil Neville. Girls, the ball, what do you think is going to happen? I am going to go 2 1 England because I just can't see past Serena Beacon. I think she's, she's she'll won. win. She's yeah. 3 2 England. Oh, I want them. So yeah. that. Lizzie, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to agree. 3-2 US um, going for the drama. Yeah. Oh, gosh, it's, going to be, it's going to be an exciting What could be a nil-nil draw? <laughs> yeah. Like, yawn. Vigna uh, doesn't no concede reason. goals. That's <laughs> true. Um, everything and it's up. <laughs> nil, nil. I can't wait. A massive week coming up. Scotland against Austria on Thursday. Everything crossed for Scotland. Then it's Leanne, the Republic of Ireland, Again, Scotland or Austria. <laughs> uh, we will see what happens either in Scotland or away at Austria. Yeah, and Wales, Bosnia. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chris. I'm sorry. What can we expect from that? Um, Wales to win comfortably. It's going to be comfortably. great. They've got. They've had a skoosh. Um, interesting times, guys. Thank you very much all uh, for your company today. We'll maybe see some of you on Friday at the game. Uh, Leanne, best of luck with your recovery. Really Thank good you. to have you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for such an honest chat as well. It was good to good to get such insight from you and know how you're doing. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Girls in the ball, Lizzie from uh, the US. Thank you very much for your time and have a good one. Okay.
Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.